Yes, Mr. Anderson. Just uh, on the issue of how different the pleaded case now is to that which was pleaded and was before the Court of Appeal last year, <clears throat> I'd like to take the Court to uh, last year, to, to the hearing and to the, um, the way in which the events unfolded at the hearing for the Court to reach the conclusions that it did. Uh, and we begin at paragraph 47 of the judgment at page 301 of the supplemental bundle. <coughs> yes. And um, <coughs> his lordship introduced the, the submissions of counsel. And Mr. Ashworth's first submission uh, is recorded in the fourth line of paragraph 47. The petition contained no allegation that Michael had any equitable entitlement to sole management and control of any of the companies, and there was no basis for such a constraint. And in response to that submission, uh, which is the submission that was eventually upheld, uh, we read in paragraph 48 that Mr. Stockhill introduced uh, a proposed amendment. Uh, and the court was prepared to entertain the case on the basis of this amendment, although permission hadn't yet been given for it. And the amendment, we, I think we only really need to look at the first paragraph of it, uh, was that g given the history and the circumstances, the petitioner had legitimate expectations giving rise to equitable constraints, etc., including the right to manage the companies. Uh, and the allegation being made was that he had the right to manage the companies exclusively. Uh, and if we go on to paragraph 49, in the middle of the paragraph, we learn that the court asked Mr. Stockhill to identify the paragraphs of the petition on which the equitable constraint was founded. It's about eight or ten lines down. And he Mr. Stockel pointed the court to paragraphs 43 to 49. So if we, if we could go to those paragraphs in the core bundle at page 244. But, um, he says, I hope I don't do injustice to these if I summarize them. Um, yes. Uh, it, um, does he do justice to them? Um, he, he does, yes. So we don't need to go to them. They, they were... The paragraphs at 43 to 49, um, which uh, I've already taken you to, and <coughs> they allege that Michael was the driving force. Yes. And it's, it's on the basis that that was how the case was put that the Court of Appeal last time concluded at uh, paragraph 50 uh, that those paragraphs provide no basis for the case that was being advanced. Uh, and that's, uh, as, as we now look at it, in light of the, uh, the way in which the court understood the case, uh, behind which we do not seek to go, uh, it's not surprising that the conclusion was what it was. Uh, in, in fact, it isn't that, as the court saw it last time, there wasn't pleaded an adequate basis for an understanding. There, there wasn't actually pleaded an understanding at all. The, the pleading was a legitimate expectation arising from historical driving force. And so uh, Judge Cook was entirely right in paragraph... 22 and 23 of his judgment to draw a distinction between that uh, pleading as it then stood and the amended pleading. That's at page 225 of the core bundle. Won't read them out, they're there for the court to read. We say that those paragraphs 22 and 23 are spot on.
we, we've now pleaded not only facts from which an understanding might be inferred, including those that I began my submissions with, uh, but we've pleaded an actual understanding, an, a, an explicit subjective understanding uh, on the part of all of the participants. Um, <coughs> where, who, who was first to use the word understanding? You, it's referred to by Lord Justice Floyd in paragraph 50. Nice does he say somewhere that an understanding short of express agreement would be enough? He, he doesn't, but he doesn't need to say that. It's, it's um, fundamental law that it's enough, that an understanding is enough. I can, I can take the court to abundant authority for that if I have to, um, but that is certainly our position, and there's nothing in this judgment to suggest otherwise. It, it's well established that uh, in order to give rise to this equity that we rely on, you don't need to establish an agreement, um, not even an incomplete agreement. An understanding will do, provided it's one that can give that affects the conscience of the respondent. difference between an <coughs> understanding inferred from a set of facts and a legitimate expectation? I don't know. Uh, it, one, it's a question that you can't really answer in the abstract. Uh, but if you give a set of facts, you can usually tell the difference on the basis of those facts. So um, we, we say that the court can no longer understand that Michael is pursuing what was described in the Court of Appeal last time as the driving force fallacy, that he's, he's pleaded an understanding, an actual understanding, <coughs> and he's, he's pleaded a basis for it as well, but, um, both of which were absent before. And it, it really is quite stark. If That's why I, I did su first suggest we go to paragraphs 43 to 49, to, because they, they, when read, and when, when read in the light of this point, that they were all the Court of Appeal had before it as the basis, it, it's really not surprising that the conclusion was reached which was reached. And if one can compare that with the pleading mm -hmm. as it now stands, which goes very much further, as Judge Cook found. <coughs> <clears throat> so we, we say that exclusion from the management of Kingsford uh, is um, unfair uh, uh, and is prejudicial and at least arguably so because the court doesn't have the material upon which to make any conclusions uh, and um, that part of the pleading should be allowed to stand. Can, can I turn next to paragraphs 99 onwards in the points of claim? In, in any event, the basis of the parties' association has been frustrated by the breakdown in relations, by the refusal to allow the petitioner to pursue the investment strategy, by the petitioner's exclusion from management, and by the threats to call in the loans. I'll come to the loans later. The respondents, in seeking to continue the association in these circumstances, uh, are, are guilty of conduct which is unfairly un prejudicial to the petitioner's interest. 
He never agreed to this situation. He didn't invest his capital on this basis. Uh, and in order to remedy the current unfairness that now obtains, there should be the remedy that we seek, which is either a buyout or a sale of the business pursuant to a just and equitable winding up, or possibly pursuant to an order under Section 996. Um, Judge Cook specifically upheld this alternative argument that e even if you, 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 you don't blame Ivy for the exclusion, you don't cast any blame at all, we are where we are and we can't stay here, is the argument. And Judge Cook up upheld the argument as arguable at paragraphs 15, 33, and 45. The Lords, I, I, should, I should warn the court that in, in the, Judge Cook's judgment, of course, he's referring to different paragraph numbers, unfortunately, because the, the, the entire proposed amendment, amended pleading didn't survive his judgment, and paragraphs were excised. Mm. So he's talking in paragraph 15 about the paragraphs I just drew your attention to. <clears throat> and he discusses them then at paragraph 33, briefly. And the paragraph 45 upholds it as arguable. Now, there's a difference, of course, uh, as to whether the basis of association has been lost through fault on the part of the petitioner or through nobody's fault. And I'll have to um, withstand the, the barrage when I make this submission again in relation to sales. But in relation to Kingsford, uh, what the submission amounts to is that in, in the case of Kingsford, we say that it's at least arguable that he should never have been excluded from the management. Um, uh, but whatever view you take of that, uh, he should now be bought out, or the partnership, as it is, should be dissolved. And, and that really is a classic uh, application of the Ebrahimi case. It also arises in the case of O'Neill and Phillips, <clears throat> which is a case where the, the claim failed, but only because the majority shareholder was prepared to continue working with the minority shareholder. Uh, the, the, court, the House of Lords nevertheless said, if Mr. O'Neill had been excluded from management without an offer for his share, then the exclusion without the offer would combined have been unfair prejudice, unfairly prejudicial. I need to manage my time carefully, but I will take your lordship to that case if I may, even though it's a very well known one. <coughs> It's in the authorities bundle at page 190. Tab 7. Thank you. <coughs> and th th in this case, um, Mr. Phillips owned the business. He gave 25% of it to Mr. O'Neill and promised <coughs> or indicated that in future that would increase to 50%, and in the meantime, allowed Mr. O'Neill 50% of the profits. Mr. Phillips then changed his mind and decided that Mr. O'Neill wasn't really up to it, so he reduced the remuneration back to 25% and said that he was never going to give him the other, the other quarter. Uh, Mr. O'Neill mm -hmm. um, brought an unfair prejudice petition, and in the House, uh, he won in the Court of Appeal, but he lost in the House of Lords on the basis that there had never been any expectation enforceable in law or recognized by equity uh, that he should become a 50% shareholder. Uh, nevertheless, the, the court discussed um, the, 
beginning at internal page 1101, uh, the, the learning that had built up around uh, unfair prejudice petitions. <coughs> And there's a passage marked already in your Lordship's copy, but the passage I would draw attention to is at the bottom of the page, after the letter H. Uh, and his, his Lordship recognises the existence of a situation where uh, the relationship <coughs> frustrated, like a contract can be frustrated. And, and one party can, can say, I didn't agree to this deal. This isn't the deal I agreed to. Uh, but, it, but he goes on, in, in this particular case, that this doesn't arise. But that theme is picked up again under the heading number seven, at the bottom of page, in, in uh, internal page 1102, letter H. It, it would have been unfair of Mr. Phillips to, Phillips to use his voting powers under the articles to remove Mr. O'Neill from participation in the conduct of the business without giving him the opportunity to sell his interest in the company at a fair price. He, he says it, that wouldn't have been the position in 1985 upon the acquisition of the shares, but it became the position because of Mr. O'Neill's work in the meantime. And over the page, uh, third line, Mr. O'Neill invested his own profits in the company by leaving some on loan account and agreeing to part being capitalized as shares. He worked to build up the business. He guaranteed its bank account and mortgage to house. Uh, Harmer shows that shareholders who receive their shares as a gift but afterwards work in the business may become entitled to enforce equitable restraints on the conduct of the majority shareholder. The difficulty of Mr. O'Neill in this case is that Mr. Phillips did not remove him from participation in the management. If we go on over the next page, 1104, uh, his Lordship discusses no-fault divorce under the heading number eight and rejects the idea that uh, a person who wants out, who has not been excluded, but want, wants out anyway, can demand to have his shares bought out at a valuation. That was the submission being made by Mr. Hollington, which was rejected. And then at page 204 in the bundle, 1106 internally, at the very bottom of the page, his lordship again says this was an unusual case in that Mr. Phillips was willing to go on working with Mr. O'Neill. This is a position which the majority shareholder is entitled to take. Uh, usually, however, the majority shareholder will want to put an end to the association in such a case, it will almost always be unfair for the minority shareholder to be excluded without an offer to buy his shares or make some other fair arrangement. The Law Commission report on shareholder remedies has recommended that in a private company limited by shares in which substantially all the members are directors, there should be a statutory presumption that the removal of a shareholder as a director or from substantially all his functions as a director is unfairly prejudicial conduct <clears throat> this does not seem to me very different in practice from the present law. But the unfairness does not lie in the exclusion alone, but in exclusion without a reasonable offer. It, it, um, I won't come back to this when discussing the offer that's been made in this case, but I would invite your Lordship to bear this line in mind. If the respondent to a petition has plainly made a reasonable offer, then the exclusion as such will not be unfairly prejudicial, and he'll be entitled to have the petition. <clears throat> he then goes to the passage that Mr. Ashworth already read um, about what is a fair offer, a reasonable offer.
So Michael has been excluded from Kingsford and has had other benefits withdrawn as well. I'll come to the loans, but he's also had his access to the cash flow, for example, withdrawn. And that's pleaded in the amended <coughs> petition. Uh, and we say that that is all part and parcel of his loss of the basis of his investment, and that therefore it's simply unfair and wrong uh, that he should be held to his investment while others enjoy the fruits of it in the form of continuing benefits of the type that he is now being denied. And wh whether that would still be the case in, in sales, I'll come to in a minute when discussing sales. Uh, I'll move then to the loan issue. It, this is, this is a, a simple, familiar commercial situation where business people, particularly of, of the less sophisticated uh, variety, that is to say the less the, the smaller businesses of this land, uh, have very many intercompany loans in place uh, because that is the sort of financing that suits them. It's a very commonplace situation. And um, this business empire of caravan sites it was by no means unusual uh, in having loans outstanding of this order. And we will submit at trial, if we get that far, that it's perfectly usual to have loans outstanding on the understanding that they're not going to be repaid uh, unless something unexpected turns up. It, it, it's no good looking in such situations for the circumstances that the parties have agreed as to what those circumstances might be, because typically business people don't agree. Uh, they don't even think about it. They don't think to themselves, well, will it be repayable on a liquidation? Will it be repayable if the bank starts to ask questions? Will it be repayable in this, that, or the other situation, including uh, if we uh, split up and we fall out? Business people don't think about those. What's important is what their understanding is about what they did think about. And we say that the understanding that they had, that they did think about, did not encompass uh, that one of them, uh, who happened to be in control of the lending company, would, following falling out with the minority, <coughs> uh, simply use the loan as a weapon to make a spiteful demand in order to cause trouble for the other party with whom they've now fallen out. That simply was not part of the understanding. Now, th this is an argument that followed uh, the dismissal of, effectively, the dismissal of the last petition by the Court of Appeal. But it isn't a new and reactive uh, point that we only thought up because our earlier petition was getting into trouble. It, it's a recent addition, or was before Judge Cook a recent addition, uh, because the respondents only threatened to call in the loan. Um, at a late stage before that hearing. The, the correspondence need, needs some attention briefly, and it's in the supplemental bundle, I think at page 312. a letter that, first of all, uh, in the case of Far Forest, Michael's own site, 
demanded repayment of 1.2 million. Uh, and uh, indicated that security would be required to <coughs> be repaid immediately. In the case of Quatford, it proposed not the repayment of the loan in the first instance, but a sale of the, of the site of the business because it was deadlocked. And in the final sentence of the first paragraph under that heading says it is anticipated there will also be sufficient funds to distribute to each of them as a shareholder. That's Ivy and Michael. Now Michael lives there so one might think that that wouldn't be a welcome proposition to him. Uh, we know how Ivy reacted when it was proposed that her home site be sold. Uh, we'll be hearing more of that this afternoon. Uh, as to Riverside, uh, there, there was a simple indication that, um, that there needed to be repaid. Your Lordships will note that for Bretton Park, although that is a debtor company, it's one of which Ivy claims to be the beneficial owner. And there is no demand made for return of that loan. Despite the purported existence of a commercial need uh, to get in this money. Now, th those, that letter was met on the 12th of October at page 350 with a response which can be summarized that uh, Far Forest will provide security. <coughs> Quatford, yes, we'll, we'll sell it. That's agreed and we've instructed an agent. And Riverside, yep, we'll, we'll cooperate in provision of security. Whereupon, at page 317, on the 14th of October, uh, I, I should add that, of course, the proposal for security was accompanied by a proposal that it shouldn't be called in shouldn't be enforced until this litigation was over to hold the ring. But that wasn't acceptable. Um, so the loan to Far, Far Forest, we see at page 317, your proposal is not acceptable. The loan has to be repaid within three months, otherwise we will enforce the security. Uh, there are then a number of reasons given as to why, after all, uh, Quatford can't be sold. Uh, but instead, now, well, given that it can't be sold, and, and it says in, in the, this is the last paragraph before the heading lending to Riverside, there's now a concern, despite uh, it having been said before that there'd be a surplus for shareholders, there's a real concern that it can't repay the loans, uh, and there is a threat that um, the loans will be demanded and as a result, Quatford will have to go into administration. Now, that's an important threat because Ivy is a director of Quatford. She can therefore prevent it from repaying the loan. Uh, she is in control of the creditor and would therefore effectively control the administration. And so this is a way of her getting control of Quatford. That was mid-October, and uh, there was a hearing on the 24th of November, the, the hearing from which you're, you're, this court is now hearing an appeal, and by then the draft pleading had been drafted and promulgated. It was not a last-minute reactive uh, strike resulting from the loss of the earlier petition. It was a reaction to events on the ground. Um, Judge Cook found that paragraph 60 that there was no commercial reason for calling in these loans. And that finding must mean 
that the loans are being called in it must mean that it's at least arguable that the loans are being called in out of spite, in bad faith, and for inappropriate reasons. But your, your case is that the loans can't be called in in any circumstances. Put, put aside liquidation where different players enter the field, but um, this side of a liquidation, the loans cannot be called in without the consent of Michael. No, my lord. That, that's the corner into which Mr. Ashworth is trying to drive us. But it isn't our case. Well, you, you, you say in your skeleton, it's Michael's case, the parties to this litigation had a mutual intention that the loan remains outstanding indefinitely. That was their mutual intention. That's a literal statement of fact. Right. It, it isn't... You, if, if you try and bring a lawyer's mind to that, that sentence, then one might start asking all sorts of questions about it. Like, what actually does that mean? But if one takes it at face value, and perhaps we ought to concentrate on the pleading rather than the uh, skeleton, but it's at paragraph 85, uh, page 254. If, if your lordship just reads this as a statement of lay people's state of mind and not as an attempt at expressing um, the legal consequences of that state of mind, then what one better understands it? It was the clear understanding of the parties <laughs> that the loans would remain outstanding indefinitely. That's, I, I can't give evidence, but this is only a pleading. But that means that that's what they understood. That's yeah. what they intended. And the only circumstances where repayments were intended were where the parties agreed. Yes. But they, that's because they hadn't thought of other possibilities. They hadn't thought about a liquidation. They hadn't thought about a Section 994 petition. They hadn't thought about the need to sell the business. That th this is not an attempt, despite Mr. Ashworth's best endeavours, is not an attempt at defining a legal agreement. Wh where we're going with this is is to say, never mind what the position would have been if a liquidator had been appointed. Never mind what the position would have been if this, that, or the other. Is this is the situation in which we are now in, <coughs> where? Uh, Ivy is calling in this loan out of spite on our case. Is that the deal into which Michael entered? And the answer is no, it wasn't. His understanding and Ivy's was that the loan wouldn't be called in unless everyone agreed. Now, I'm, not, I'm not trying to say that therefore there was a, an equity binding on the bank or on a liquidator. Plainly wasn't. The loan repayable in, in, in law on demand. But it was their understanding which did not result in a legal agreement that it would remain outstanding until they agreed otherwise. Okay. Well, if that's right, then it doesn't matter whether the motive is spite. There was no agreement. Therefore, Ivy has no right to, uh, uh, to call in the loan or to um, ensure that another company calls in. Well, she, she has. We, we, we recognise that the end result of all of this is going to be um, the dissolution of this business arrangement. So that the loans will have to be repaid or accounted for in some way. Uh, the, the position that we don't want to place is having the benefits of the loans withdrawn but having the rest of our capital held in to the lender. Because that isn't the deal that we made. But that, that's why it, it isn't so much the demand that's the problem. It's the demand not accompanied by an offer to buy him out of Kingsford. 
or sales, is it? You are focusing there on the creditors. Sorry? You are focusing there on the creditors. Absolutely. It's the, the unfairness is associated with Michael's interest as a member of the lender company because the indefinite, as he would have liked it to be and as Ivy intended it to be as well, the indefinite interest-free loan obviously came Michael's way because he was a participator in the company. Can we just pause on that? You say it obviously came his way because he was a participator. Yet, in the pleadings, he draws parallels with gifts made to other members of the family yes. who were neither in the partnership nor yes. members of the relevant company. Can you just explore that? Well, the, 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 the analogy... The, no, it's not an analogy with gifts. The reference to the earlier gifts is partly evidential to reinforce the notion that uh, they did have this understanding that these wouldn't be repayable, except in by agreement of both parties. Um, and it's partly uh, it, because because the, the underlying fun fundamental commercial reality of what was going on was that the, the the wider business was acquiring another caravan site, and before they'd done it by gifts from the partnership which would have been taxed as drawings. But now, they're doing it as a loan from Kingsford, which won't be taxed at all. I understand that. My point is a slightly different one, which is, as I understand it, you need to demonstrate that the conduct relates to Michael's role as shareholder. Yes. And my point is that the comparison is being drawn with gifts to siblings who were not shareholders. You, you were making the point that he must have received the benefit of that loan in his capacity as a shareholder. Well, I, I'm making the point that he received that bounty, partly obviously in his capacity as a son, but he, he is also a shareholder in the company and therefore um, one third of the benefit or the, the detriment of letting that loan go on those terms is his. Um, so he's, he, he's involved as a shareholder on the lender side as well. The unfairness lies not, not only in the fact of calling in the loan without making him an offer, but in the fact that he's got two directors on the board of the company in which he's a one-third shareholder, making decisions out of spite for him. And Judge Cook recognized that point at paragraphs 39 and 60. And it's made in the respondent's notice, just in case he didn't. And it's pleaded in paragraph 98. I, I, it's no answer, is it, to, to say, well, he, he came by the loans because he was a director of the company or a shareholder in the company. It's no answer to say, well, others got similar bounty or even better bounty because they were gifts and they weren't shareholders or directors. This is a family business. You can't really distinguish uh, between, uh, in, in real terms, you can't distinguish between uh, the parties, the participants, capacities. It's unreal to try and do it. Uh, and Judge Cook found that paragraph 98.1 was reasonably arguable. In paragraphs 26, 27, 35, and 40 to 41. I'm afraid that, um, as Mr. Ashworth did, I, I'm, 
I'm going to presume on the court uh, to read or reread parts of our skeleton to deal with specific points yes. uh, rather than go through it. And grounds of appeal 4A and 4B are dealt with in paragraphs 39 and 40 of the skeleton. Ground of Appeal 4D at um, 44 to 49. <coughs> I wasn't proposing to, to rehearse those arguments again here uh, because I don't have time to do so. One final point that I would add on loans is that it's implicit in the insistence on majority rule that the respondents um, emphasize that they could sanction loans to themselves even whilst calling in the loan to Far Forest. <coughs> and it's noticeable in this respect. And in fact, that has happened. They've taken small loans out of beauty sales to fund legal expenses recently, much smaller amounts. Uh, and they didn't call in the loan to Bretton Park, a company which Ivy uh, claims to own. Uh, and uh, that only serves to highlight the unfairness to Michael of having the loan to his company called in. Now, dealing with Beaudley sales, uh, th this is a quasi-partnership. One only has to look at the circumstances of its incorporation. It was incorporated to sell and to buy and sell caravans on the partnership sites, a business which had until that moment been conducted by the partnerships for the profit of the partnership. And its shareholders were the same as the partners in the same shares. Uh, nevertheless, the defense denies that it's a quasi-partnership. We say that's a surprising <coughs> thing. Uh, exclusion from management is not available as a ground of complaint in itself. But the uh, question is, should the exclusion be accompanied by uh, an offer for Michael's shares or an agreement that the company be wound up? And we submit that the answer is that it depends. It depends on whether excluding him without buying his shares is a reasonable and proportionate response to the, all the circumstances, which include uh, his wrongdoing in taking 1.25 million, but also includes the wrongdoing of the respondents. And it, it also requires the court at trial to look to the future. Because if, it, if it's the court's impression at the end of a trial that the respondents, that Mrs. Loveridge, have, have no intention of recognizing Michael as a shareholder with any rights of any kind uh, and intend forever simply to deny him any of the benefits of the income from this company, then uh, we would submit at trial that it is unfair to forever exclude him from, that, from the management of that company and from all its other benefits without buying him out. And that was the decision that Judge Hodge came to in a, in a similar case, uh, which is in the bundle of authority. Uh, we didn't include in our skeleton a, a first instance decision which merely illustrates a, a, a proposition. But it's, it is a case on extreme facts where the Petitioner lost on every ground. He was found not to be a quasi-partner. Uh, he was found to have taken money out of the company unlawfully and to have been dishonest about it. He was found to have been quite fairly dismissed from involvement in the company. 
but in paragraph 111, this is the Lloyd's Authority. Yes. Yes, thank you. Paragraph 111, page, internal page 47. Judge Hodge decided that nevertheless, Given the circumstances, including looking a bit to the future as well as to what had happened since the exclusion, hmm. that uh, this dishonest and um, uh, unmeritorious claim, nevertheless, ought to be brought out. He didn't get much because of the, the huge discount that Mr. Ashford mentioned, but he was brought out. So we, we say that, and, and it is pleaded in this case, in the amended petition, that Ivy intends to ignore Michael's rights as a, as a shareholder. Paragraph 104, uh, subparagraph 5. They intend to run the companies as if he's not a shareholder at all. They intend to exclude him from management, to oppose everything he proposes, to withhold all the benefits of being a shareholder, and to refuse him participation in available investment capital. Lords, if I'm allowed to go to trial, and if I prove that that is a true statement of fact as to their intentions as regards Michael in sales, then why shouldn't this petition succeed, even though his, his exclusion as a director um, was because he took money which he shouldn't have taken. There is also, of course, in sales, let us not forget the, the, the loans point as well. Moving on to Quatford, this is the only company which is admitted in the defence to be a, a quasi-partnership. It's, it's deadlocked. It's deadlocked at board level as well as at meeting level. But Michael lives there. He's in de facto possession. And I've already shown the court that Ivy sees the loan to Quatford as a means of taking control of it. She's been enjoined from calling it in for the time being. But if this court discharges the injunction, that is what will happen. Th there is prejudice to Michael as a shareholder in Quatford because she won't resign as a director. It, it is her duty under Section 175 of the Companies Act to avoid any situation in which she has or can have an interest that conflicts or possibly may conflict with the interests of Quatford. And one of the duties that she has to Quatford is to promote its success for the benefit of its members as a whole. Uh, and yet uh, she is also acting as a director in Kingsford and Sales. Uh, and is proposing to call in the loan for um, bad reasons. So in Quatford, it's quite right for Mr. Ashworth to say he can't plead that he's been excluded from management. But Ivy is threatening. She's poised to use her powers as a director to attempt to do so. And the well, court As a director of which company? as a director of Quatford because if as a director of Kingsford and Sales she calls in this loan as a director of Quatford she will block its repayment and in her defence at paragraph 20 subparagraph 3 she admits that were it not for the deadlock she would want Michael removed as a director of Quatford well, has 
actually, has anything been said about blocking the payment of the loan? No, but it's a fact that that's what she can do. The, the only way she that... can do. Well, is that, is that if, if one looks at the letter that, um, that her solicitors sent, to which I, I, which I showed the court, um, at page uh, 318 of the supplemental bundle. Uh, there is the threat of an appointment of an administrator. And you can see what Judge Cook made of this at paragraphs 29 to 32 of the judgment. He had no trouble in finding that it was arguable, at least, that that was what she was up to. You say she's in a position of conflict. Yes. That must always apply when one company in a family business set up lends to another. Well, except... Saying that the, the, the uh, Quay director of Kingsford, Ivy has every right, subject to the other points we make, to say we want our money back. But you say it's her duty as a director of Quatford to resist that. Well, no, it's her duty as a director of Quatford to act in the best interests of the members of that company as a whole. Yes. And that might involve resisting repayment, or it might involve making repayment. What it would not involve is allowing an insolvency process that then gives her by the back door control of the company. And uh, although there is always in, inherent conflict in these situations, yeah. usually it doesn't matter because families consent. There is complete consent by all the shareholders. Yeah. So, um, but, but the complaints that we make, I, I mean, I'd, time doesn't permit me to argue them now, but now isn't the time. The, these are arguable points that should be resolved at trial. Uh, the same goes for Riverside Starport. The same considerations apply. I'll, I'll come, therefore, to the injunction. Sorry, yeah. uh, just in relation to Riverside Starport, there's, there's no exclusion from management. You say it's in the same position as Port. It, it, it isn't quite the same, but the same considerations apply. It isn't quite the same because it's not deadlocked and Ivy's already got control via the board. But we say that there is a danger that she's trying to put Starport, Riverside Starport under um, for any number of reasons, not least because it's one of Michael's projects. I mean, th this, is, this will all be in evidence in due course, my lady, but um, it, it, she's not acting out of proper motives, and she's in a position of conflict. At this pleading stage, of course, I, I have to plead a basis for making allegations of uh, bad intention, uh, but there, there is plenty of basis in this pleading, and I don't understand uh, the respondents to be arguing um, that the allegations of bad faith are being made without any substantial uh, support from which they can be inferred. The, the, as I understand it, the, the arguments are much more technical and about, about the nature of loans. Uh, coming to the injunction, yes. in, in the case of Quatford and Riverside Starport, if, if we're right that there's an arguable case, at least, that Ivy is intending to use the loans to put the companies into some sort of insolvency process, then it will be very difficult, if not impossible, to quantify uh, the damage to Michael's interest in that company. And that's what the judge found at paragraph 56, and he was right. Uh, in the case of Far Forest, there was no evidence, Mr. Ashworth rightly points out, that Far Forest will go into insolvency if this demand is made. 
Uh, and the judge found that the impact of the demand, if made, was unknown. But, but he wasn't obliged to apply the cyanamid principles uh, as if they were some sort of roadmap um, which allowed him or required him even to take his eye off the commercial reality. In paragraph 60 of his judgment, he made a finding that it was an end of the matter. There is not, as it seems to me at the moment, any credibly asserted need in commercial terms for the money to be returned to the lending companies. Now, in, in, the, in the circumstances of this case, where there are credible allegations of bad faith and heavy breaches of director's duty in the calling in of these loans, if there is no credibly asserted commercial need to call them in, what's wrong with issuing an injunction? There, there are, there are no, there's no suggestion that the respondents uh, will suffer irreparable loss <clears throat> if it turns out that the injunction shouldn't have been granted. The measure of damages to them will be the interest on the loans over the relevant period. Uh, and the judge considered whether Michael had done enough to satisfy him that Michael could pay that interest, and he concluded in paragraph 62 that he could. It's true, there is no separate consideration in the judgment, although there was an argument, it was probed uh, a lot. In the judgment, he doesn't find the need to, to discuss uh, what exactly damage Far Forest will suffer if the loans are called in. Uh, he decided in, in the, in, in the, from the fact that there was no commercial need to call in the loans and security had been offered and refused, which is a specific point he took into account, he said that these loans must remain outstanding for the time being. This is a case where there is a high likelihood of success of the ill motive claim that Michael is making, and that should that was taken into account by Judge Cook, and his findings should be allowed to stand. Clearly, the end result is that the status quo is preserved with no damage to the respondents that can't be compensated in damages. What, what better outcome than that could this court find? Um, two, two more points. The, the offer, the offer makes the mistake of proposing to value the shareholding. It says without a minority discount, but it proposes the market value of the shareholding. The shareholding has zilch market value. The company has a market value. And what should have been proposed is to value the company and give Michael one third of that without a minority discount. We as lawyers reading the offer would probably interpret it to mean uh, what Mr. Ashworth now says it obviously means. Uh, because we know that you have to interpret the words of an offer in the factual matrix. But this is not going to be interpreted by a lawyer. It's going to be interpreted by an expert who is a, a member of RICS. And who knows what they might do when they're asked to value a minority shareholding. Of course, there, there, there can be no supervision by the court. These expert determinations, the, the expert won't come to court and ask, what does this mean? And when the expert values the shares at uh, 50 pounds, we won't be able to come to court and say, well, obviously the expert was valuing on the wrong basis because we, we accepted an expert determination and you have rough justice implicit in that, both sides. So when you make an O'Neill and Phillips offer, you have to exclude to the greatest extent that you can any room for misunderstanding. Judge Cook was wrong to say, well, I would interpret this letter as meaning what Mr. Ashworth wants it to mean, and therefore I'm rejecting Mr. Anderson's arguments. That was the wrong approach. The right approach is to ask, was this offer a, a 
obviously fair offer of the sort that Lord Hoffman talked about in that passage which I read out. It has to be an obviously fair offer um, and one that doesn't allow for mistakes. Now, therefore, for that reason alone, this is not, the offer does not contain the relief, all the relief that the claimant uh, can hope to achieve at trial. Because at trial, he'll get an order that doesn't have that potential ambiguity in it. But another way of putting it is that the offer only achieves the desired result of making the petition an abuse if it's plainly reasonable. Those are the words. Not obviously reasonable, plainly reasonable. It, there mustn't be any room for potential unfairness. But even if we're wrong about that, the problem with the offer is that it deals only with Kingsford. The judge got into something of a muddle in paragraphs 52 and 53 uh, because he mistakenly mentions the Far Forest loan uh, in, in saying that the unfairness can only be cured if the petitioner is bought out of the borrowers. And we accept that that's wrong in the case of Far Forest. It may be that he was thinking of the loan to Bretton Park, uh, but that hasn't been demanded, so that would be wrong as well. But the fact that the offer only relates to Kingsford is relevant for the following reasons. Firstly, if the respondents are allowed to force Michael to accept being bought out of Kingsford before he's bought out of Quatford, then in valuing Kingsford, uh, it'll be open to the respondents to argue to the valuer, to whom they'll have access for this purpose, that the loan will never be repaid because Quatford can't afford it. And you've seen a letter in which they've already said, when it suited them, they've already said that that might be the case. But later, having got rid of Michael out of Kingsford on the basis of a valuation that brought into doubt the ability of Quatford to repay. Later, when valuing Quatford, they'll get the full value of the diminution in value of Quatford. So they can blow hot and cold. And there won't be a court to supervise this process. It'll all be done with expert valuers. And they can get the benefit of both worlds by running opposite arguments at different times. So the two valuations ought to be undertaken at the same time with the same value. <clears throat> and this is part of a wider point that there is one overall business. It, it, it's alleged in paragraph 60 of the particulars of claim, but denied in paragraph 61 of the defense that this is one overall business. But you will see in paragraph 18 of the judgment that Judge Cook recorded an admission by Ivy in evidence that it was one overall business. Uh, where there is one overall business, or where the parties themselves, when it regarded it as one overall business, they shouldn't be allowed to pick Michael off serially, because that will enable them to manipulate prices at which they get his shares in the way that I've just illustrated and in other ways that I may not be able to think about. But the safest course is, is for everything to be done at once. <clears throat> Moreover, M Mr. Ashworth came close to uh, conceding this point, that if they choose to buy Michael out of Kingsford first, and it's their choice which company they make an offer for, uh, there's a risk that the court will be sanctioning them cherry-picking the businesses they want to buy, uh, potentially depriving the court of the ability to choose. If Ivy has only got enough money to buy Michael out of one of the companies, or two of them, then it should be the court that fashions the ultimate remedy in this sorry saga, not Mrs. Loveridge along the way deciding uh, which bits of the litigation she wants to bring to an end to her best satisfaction. Uh, she shouldn't be entitled to spend all her money on Kingsford just because Kingsford is what she wants. And the court should, of course, be alive to the risk that an O'Neill and Phillips offer for one of the companies 
in a situation where there is a dispute not only about five companies but about two partnerships, uh, three partnerships, there's a risk that the respondents are manipulating negotiations as well, putting pressure on with one offer uh, in order to get what they want in the broader picture. And the court, again, should be alive to that risk. And ultimately, it's a very simple submission that this offer was not everything that Michael can hope to achieve uh, as a result of his petition, because his petition doesn't only relate to Kingsford. Although the court will respect the corporate identity of the individual respondents, uh, Michael is not a separate individual in relation to each of those respondents. This is a fight, unfortunately, between one person who says that he's being unfairly prejudiced by one other person. And uh, tactical partial offers shouldn't be given effect. Right. Um, have we covered the ground? Um, may I crave the indulgence of um, two more minutes? I'm sorry, I'm six minutes late already. I apologise. Okay. Uh, the two minutes are these. Firstly, the offer might be withdrawn as soon as the petition is struck out. And given what you know about the um, correspondence on the loans and the change of direction depending on the response, um, if this court were making findings of fact at this stage, the finding would be that the offer will be withdrawn as soon as the petition is struck out. In, in a case where it's obviously <coughs> an offer that should be accepted and there's no doubt about it, then it might be a reasonable response to strike out the petition even if the offer still isn't on the table. Um, although that would be odd because it leaves the pot still simmering. Uh, but uh, in, in this case, uh, it's by no means obviously a reasonable offer and it would become an, an instrument of oppression if it resulted in the striking out of the petition uh, and was then withdrawn immediately. <coughs> Bretton Park, the acquisition of Bretton Park is pleaded in paragraph 27, uh, 77 of the amended petition. Uh, the defense is that Michael isn't a beneficial shareholder at all, and if that succeeds, it's an end of the matter. Uh, but it, it is pleaded in um, the amended petition at paragraph 82 that he has a right to participate in management of all the companies in paragraphs 88 and 91 Bretton Park is clearly included and in paragraph 83 there is <coughs> an allegation of exclusion from Bretton Park's management <coughs> and that's answered in the defence which shows that the defendants understood it to be a reference to Bretton Park. And the fact that he's never been a director doesn't mean he must fail in his claim as a shareholder from exclusion from management. Now, there's no threat to call in the loan in the case of Bretton for reasons I've already gone into. Uh, but finally, we say that in Bretton, the very denial that has now come uh, of his being a shareholder it is itself indicative that IB does not intend to treat him as a shareholder uh, and that therefore there should be a just and equitable winding up, if nothing else. Thank you for the additional time. Yes, Mr. My lords, Mr. Anderson starts with Kingsford. And he says, let's look at Kingsford um, and look at the way it's pleaded there. And uh, it, what he says in Kingsford might be attacked at the fringes, um, as he put it. Kingsford is not the centre of this petition. There are five companies, and unfair prejudice is asserted in respect of each of them. Do we have any evidence as to what the valuable companies? Uh, well, they're all, they're all valuable. They're companies. all. 
They're all they all own a site. Yes. Um, all of the all of the companies are profitable. Uh, I think. Apart so, there's a real estate apples in trading. That's just holds assets. We don't know about Far Forest, and uh, Quatford is, um, as we understand it, trading, but may well be balance sheet insolvent because the amount of loans are higher than the value that we've had for the, uh, the site itself. Um, but as this court said last time, you've got to look at each of the companies separately. You can't just cherry pick one and say the rest is at the fringe. They're all right in the middle. And we know why Michael has chosen Kingsford. He's chosen it because he was a director. He has been removed. And he's not been guilty of specific wrongdoing in that company, as opposed to sales. And we'll come back to that. But that situation, of course, doesn't apply to the other four companies. Sales has been properly excluded from. Bretton Park, he's not involved in the management of the company. Never has been. Riverside Starport isn't carrying on to any business. And Quatford, he is in control, to the exclusion of Ivy. It's he who is unfairly prejudicing Ivy's interest in that case. What we are left with is really his basis of association argument. That is just a roll-up, because it presupposes the very things which he needs to plead and prove. Firstly, the entitlement to be involved, and secondly, his claim about loans. It is not an independent allegation. And the Court of Appeal said last time, you have to plead the express agreement, which is disavowed, or sufficient facts to infer an agreement, and that's not been done. Yeah, and we say, as with the driving force fallacy, you cannot plead the consequence alone. You need to pre plead the matters which give rise to the consequence. And they haven't done this in this case. There is no proper pleading of a basis to be involved in the management of Kingsville. And it's important here um, that you don't have it in this jurisdiction some indefinite notion of fairness. Lord Hoffman said that uh, in uh, Neil Phillips and the references at page 1099 F to H. There are principles. It's just not, it's, it's not fair, Mum. You can't get away with that submission. It has to be against the proper principles. But, well, Lord, even if we were somehow wrong about all of this, um, and this basis of association argument had any legs, it is completely cured by the Kingsford offer in relation to Kingsford. His basis of association, he says it's not fair, now that this basis of association has fallen apart, that I'm required to keep my capital there. You're not. We've offered to buy you out. We've offered to buy you, to, to give you all that you're entitled to. Um, a few brief points on, on particular submissions were made. You referred to paragraph 54 of the amended petition, which is the original petition, being allegations of conduct which are said to be personal animus towards him, which the fa family has developed over time. They were there before the Court of Appeal previously. The Court of Appeal said not sufficient. Uh, he accepts that most of the allegations, under, particularly under uh, paragraph 61, do relate to partnership, uh, but identified two of them, 23 and 24, which are the phone calls. Um, they're all headed under the heading, breaches of the partnership order. They're all claimed to be breaches of the partnership order. You were taken to, to um, His Honour Judge Cook's judgment, where he said in paragraphs 24 and 25, it's not unusual to have arrangements of this sort in family companies. Uh, he was wrong in his analysis there, because he says it's not unusual to have the use of cars or cash, or sorry, or cars or, or cash, etc. It's not unusual, maybe not unusual to have the use of cash so that you can fund something for a short term. It is completely unusual to say you can have the use of cash which I can never call back in. That is not an asset. Once you have an agreement which says I can't call this back in, it ceases to be an asset of the paying company. Now, my own friend Lord Justice Nuji uh, interrupted my own friend talk, when talking about Kingsford about the uh, right having been wrongfully excluded or rightfully excluded 
and said, in respect to sales, you've been rightfully excluded. And uh, he, um, my friend's argument to that is effectively because the base of association has gone, no matter whether the exclusion is right or wrong, I'm still entitled to my money out. That is a no fault divorce. He could, on his analysis, just walk away. I'm walking away, and the basis of association is gone. I want no longer to be involved with you. Irrespective of anything you've done, I want nothing to do with you. It's unfair of you not to pay me my money out of the companies, because the basis of association is gone. Now, if that's right, that is no fault divorce par excellence. And then you go one step further, which is I have been rightfully exclusive, excluded because I've taken £1.25 million in breach of my duty. And I can force a divorce upon you and require you to pay me out, despite the fact I have been properly excluded. So he's taking Lord Hoffman's um, unfair prejudice, saying he's wrong implicitly about no-fault divorce. Not only that, he's also wrong because it goes further. You can have a fault divorce. Whether, whether it's a wrong analogy, well, I appreciate it, but it's, uh, I hope you get uh, the point there. Um, your Lordship, um, Lord Justice Bean raised the question about no one knowing about him taking the money out. The response was he told his accountant about it. It's right, but he only told his accountant about it after he had done it. And Mr. Warman, uh, there was a witness statement in these proceedings in which he, Michael himself says, Mr. Warman did not know about my withdrawal from the Beaudley account before it was done. My learned friend has not addressed the fact that the judge said in his judgment, at paragraph 25, he thought it's pleaded albeit in somewhat oblique terms. It's, it's, very difficult to, I mean, it's more than oblique, it's completely just not there. Um, in my respect, which has been helped out by the judge below, uh, but that is not the, correct, not the right thing to do. Um, just on the timing, so we can be clear about this, the Kingsford offer was made the 30th of October. 2020. The um, new allegation about the loans first surfaced in November 2020. He was not removed as a director of Kingsford until after uh, the 9th of December 2020. So we made an O'Neill and Phillips offer to him before he'd actually been excluded, but he was still remained a director of Kingsford. So there can't be any uh, question of unfairness of him being excluded and being locked in, here's your offer, and we're going to exclude you subsequently. So there simply can't be any uh, question uh, of that. Can I invite you, please, just to make a note uh, at this stage, to read, when, when going through the correspondence, our letter of the 6th of November 2020, page 323, at the back of the supplemental bundle, at tab 17, where we actually set out at 324 what it is we want in respect of each of the companies. A repayment of Far Forest Loan. We want um, a charge in respect of Watford, and we set out the reasons why we want a charge in respect of Watford. We want a charge in respect of Riverside, but there's still going to be a director's meeting in order to discuss that. So that's what we are after here. That's, that's the extent of the loans. What was the basis for the injunction? It wasn't a threat to call these things in apart from the Far Forest Loan. And he hasn't, simply hasn't addressed how the Far Forest Loan can possibly fit into the, the scheme of everything. Um, there is a, um, my friend asked you to read paragraphs 44 to 49 of his discussion and argument on 4D, ground 4D, which is the question of the loan being repayable on demand. In that, at paragraph 46, there appears to be a shift of position to say, we may have been wrong about it being repayable on demand, it may be repayable immediately. Having got the amendment on express basis that it's repayable on demand, that was a skeleton argument below and a submission to the judge below, he can't now say, oh, well, actually, we may have been wrong about that, it may have been repayable immediately. But even if he is, it makes no difference. You're having people agreeing two things at the same time, apparently. I'm going to lend you something which is repayable immediately, at the same time I'm going to agree that it's never repayable. I thought the point was that, as a matter of law, if you make a loan without stipulating when it's repayable, and you say it's repayable on demand, in fact, you don't need a demand at 
people have become too powerful. The limitation period starts immediately. Uh, well, well, that may be right, but the point is you can't agree to think two inconsistent things, and that's their, that's why it's an illogical impossibility for them to have done what they they said. Um, my lords, you were taken to Lord's auto body very briefly. Um, you'll, you'll know that because it was in greater depth. It's wrong. The decision is just plainly wrong. Because having been an un, a proper exclusion, then to go and say, nonetheless, you can have your money out for some 60% discount. And there's no idea as to how we get to 60% discount. It really is, I'm afraid, a judge sitting under a palm tree and saying, I want to be fair to you somehow. And that's not the principal basis. Um, and the, then the suggestion that the court did not need to apply American sign of it, it was not addressed on the basis this is a Nottingham uh, type case where I'm bound to win and therefore it's a much uh, I've, I've satisfied that higher burden so I don't need to worry about American sign of it type of things and even then American sign of it applies we've still got to look at adequacy of damages and balance of convenience um, and uh, the, there was no uh, suggestion there, I mean, he accepts there's no analysis by the judge of American sentiment, of the adequacy of damages. And any way you look at it, there's no evidence before him that Michael would suffer any loss at all. And it said against us, um, what we would lose would be the loss of interest. We are the petitioners, we're not the companies. It's what the companies might lose. This injunction is against us personally, it's not against the companies. So the undertaking is given to us individually not to the companies. We don't have that loss. We're all into a world of reflective loss, where that might take us. That's not open to us. And there is no evidence that damages would be adequate as a remedy for us. But what would you lose? Uh, we, might, we might lose the value of the company because the shares, because the loans become irrecoverable. So let's take Far Forest. It goes to the wall between now, between when we wanted the money back and when we finally get to the end of the trial, the 1.9, 1.28 million pounds is not really recoverable by Kingsford and sales, and then we lose our value in the shares in those companies. So would you not be adequately compensated for by taking account of that in any order that was made? Well, well but, but, but how? If, if it, let's, say, let's say it destroys the value in our company completely. So you have a scenario, Far Forest goes to the wall, we're down 1.28 million, that puts us to the sword, and suddenly we're left with nothing at all. Michael's got shares in the company worth nothing. How's he going to, how is he going to pay us? What's he going to have left to pay us? Is it realistic to suppose who, there's somewhere evidence that the businesses are hold worth 50 million? <laughs> that's an assertion that's been made repeatedly by Michael. It's nowhere near our, our valuation. Um, we do have a substantial valuation, but that's always been his assertion. It's a £50 million pound company. Um, I think highly unlikely, my lord. Um, Are you saying that it's realistically possible at the end of the day you might win and, and Michael will be unable to meet the cost of taking the damages? We just don't know, my lord. I mean, he, it's up to him to discharge that burden. And he hasn't put forward any evidence at all. And we just said that the real problem is, can we quantify our loss? And that may be very difficult to do. And if we can't quantify our loss, then we know that an undertaking damages won't meet any concern we have. And you say that Judge didn't deal with this. He said there was no commercial reason for yeah. calling in the loan. And you say, so what? That's, that's nothing to do with that. If that's anything, it's balance of convenience. It's not adequate. Absolutely, yes. Um, uh, it was said by Mr. Anderson that this shouldn't have been a problem because his client was offering security. My Lord, yes, but if you read the correspondence, he was offering security that wouldn't be called in until the determination of these proceedings. So we're tied in for forever. And it, um, uh, uh, sorry, that's in respect to Far Forest in particular. Yes. So a company which has nothing to do with these proceedings. Yes. We just have to hope that in two years' time, whenever this gets to an end and the Court of Appeal, because it's never to be one of the other parties is going to appeal to the Court of Appeal, we hope there's something left at the end of the day. 
And uh, finally, um, on the question of the uh, offer letter, um, <laughs> the, um, any expert would deal with this properly. There's nothing to say an expert, an expert determination can't ask the parties what they believe this offer means, if he's in any doubt at all about it. Expert determiners frequently even appoint QCs. I've been the lucky recipient of these instructions to give an advice as to what it means. Where both the parties are agreed as to what this means, then the point that this is here to be read by a, an expert and not by a lawyer is a bad point. His lordship below was right on this point. It plainly is an offer for one third of the company, the value of the company, with no discount. And that uh, deals with, with that point. The offer is plainly a fair one. Unless there are any other points I can assist you, and I apologise for that. I think I've... No, I think you've, just like you've, you've been 15 minutes, minutes on, on the button since uh, um, uh, Mr. Anderson sat down. Any questions on the Thank you. Right. Um, well, that will leave my uh, junior to address the court on the costs. Yes. Yes, Mr. Prince. My, my, my lady, this is an appeal against costs order, and as this court has repeatedly explained, a litigant bringing such an appeal faces a heavy burden. Yes. But in the present case, it is a burden that the appellant, Ivy, can discharge. We submit that in deciding to make no order as to the costs of the committal application that Michael brought against his mother and unilaterally decided to withdraw, the judge, first of all, erred in principle and in law and or in fact. Further alternatively, second, took into account an immaterial factor, namely his view as to the prospects of the allegations of contempt against Ivy being proved, and or failed to take into account a material factor, <coughs> namely the presumption of innocence which Ivy enjoyed. The upshot of the judge's decision in respect of the committal application is that Ivy has to bear the costs of defending allegations of contempt that went entirely unproven and which Michael withdrew unilaterally. That outcome is not only wrong in law, it is profoundly unjust. And for the reasons that I will explain, the court is invited to remedy. As my lords and my lady will know, this is not a case in which committal proceedings were compromised, subject to the court's approval, as part of a wide assessment with costs to be decided by the court. Michael simply unilaterally decided to withdraw and obtain the permission of the court to do so. So errors of principle. I say that there are two errors of principle and or law. First, the judge erred in making any assessment as to the merits of the committal application against Ivy. And second, the judge erred in rejecting the submission that the committal application should be regarded as having entirely failed. I say there's errors of principle, there are also errors of law. It was wrong as a matter of principle for the judge to conclude that there was a very strong likelihood, that's a direct quote from the judgment, that certain allegations would be proved against Ivy. Alternatively, to reach or express any view, even a provisional view, as to the likelihood of the committal application being proved against Ivy. That error infected and made unsafe the judge's exercise of discretion. The judge's findings as to the merits of the committal application are set out in paragraph 29 of our skeleton. Yes. So paragraphs three to seven. Yes. It might be worth turning that up, but I certainly won't read them to the court. The reference is core bundle tab four, pages 32, 33. What, what was the evidence before the judge about, about the incidents at, 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 at that stage? So my lord, the, the evidence was very limited indeed because it was only the evidence in support of the application and then there was Mr. Rome's, he's Ivy's solicitor, his witness statement uh, in support of effectively the application for the costs of the committal application. That witness statement exhibited 
what was only a draft affidavit from Ivy, so, so an affidavit which had not been uh, finished. And importantly, this is a point we made below, the judge did not have before him the totality of the evidence that Ivy might have chosen to deploy at the trial of the committal application. So there was only a single affidavit in draft. And of course, as my Lord will know, even up to the moment where the applicant closed his case, it was for Ivy to elect whether to give any evidence at all. Yeah. When, when was the committal application to be heard? It was, it was to be heard when the hearing at which the cost order was made ended up happening. So, so, so the 24th of November, my lord. And when, when was the application withdrawn? So the, applica the application for permission to, to withdraw, my lord, if you'll just bear with me yes. one moment. The application for permission to withdraw was made in in September, I'll get the precise date to your lordship, um, and then the, uh, the so the hearing was not vacated until um, the court granted permission for the application to be withdrawn, and in the witness statement that Mr. Avril, Michael's solicitor, produced seeking the court's permission, he suggested that the issue of costs uh, be determined at the hearing that had previously been listed for the hearing of the committal application, the substantive hearing. Yes. It, it, it's, it's, it's relevant to note just so that my Lord, Lord Justine has the, the, the full chronology. When Michael indicated that he was going to apply to withdraw uh, the committal application, um, Ivy offered to accept her costs on the standard basis. Uh, and, and Michael uh, re refused that offer. Um, when was that? Um, my Lord. When did Ivy 14th, offer to accept? Fourteenth of August was the offer from Ivy, my Lord. Fourteenth of August. My Lord, yes, because Michael indicated his intention to apply for permission to withdraw, and Ivy said, "That's fine if you." Succeed in withdrawing, or is it, if the court grants you permission to withdraw, I, I will accept my costs on the standard basis. And, and Michael uh, re refused that offer, my lord. Uh, and so that was the position going into the hearing before His Honour Judge Kirk. Yes. My lord, Lord Justice, been asked what was the evidence before His Lordship, uh, and I've answered that yes. question. But the essential point of principle my lord, is that uh, irrespective of what evidence was before his lordship, Ivy was entitled to the presumption of innocence. No allegation had been proved. The evidence in support of the committal application had not been tested at all. Yes. And I, 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 to cut matters short, speaking of myself, I, I see why you say that it was wrong to, to make no but why do you say that the judge should have made an indemnity cost? My Lord, I, I can go straight to that point if it would yes. assist, assist your Lordship. Yes. Um, the, the first point that goes to why I say indemnity costs are appropriate is based upon the presumption of innocence. So uh, I say that one, one has to start from the premise that a committal application that is withdrawn has wholly failed. And, and whereas where normal civil litigation is discontinued, standard basis is the default. My primary submission is, where you bring a committal application, threatening the liberty of the respondent, and then unilaterally decide to withdraw it, that fact of itself takes the matter outside the norm, so as to justify an indemnity cost order, absent exceptional circumstances. That's my that's my first submission, my lord. That, that indemnity cost order would, would would be justified in those circumstances, uh, absent anything exceptional. But is there, is there any authority you rely on? There's, there's no there's no authority, my lord, in, in support of that or, or, or contrary to it. Uh, and m m my lord, the second submission is 
Ivy made the offer to accept her cost of the standard basis. But presumably she stopped work on her draft affidavit once. No, no, not, not so, my lord, because of Michael's delay in making the application to, discon dis to discontinue. So Michael had to make the application for permission to discontinue. There was a timetable in place for Ivy to produce her evidence, and the hearing was listed. So she couldn't stop working. She, conti yes. she continued working, and Mr. Rome addresses that in his, in his witness statement that was before the judge. So she couldn't stop work. She couldn't down tools safely, but my lord. Presumably no. she stopped, on that basis, she stopped work only when the court granted or at least when the application for permission to discontinue was made. Um, my, my, I have to take instructions as to precisely yeah. when she stopped. She stopped at some point after the application for permission to discontinue was made. Do we know what the quantum of costs in this year is? My Lord, we do from Mr. Rome's witness statement. So as at the date of the witness statement, they were around £23,000. Um, I have the exact figure. It's £22,906.50. That was as at the 18th of November 2020. That's paragraph 19 of Mr. Rome's witness statement. So, ju just to, to summarise your two points, you say that on the basis of presumption of innocence, any committal application which is unilaterally withdrawn should carry indemnity costs, absent some special factor, from the time it was made, which would be 2nd of July. Alternatively, if you're wrong about that, you say that there should be indemnity costs from the date of the offer, uh, which was 14th of August. Well, my lord, I wouldn't wish to be nailed down to the date of the offer because the fact of the offer is just one of the other factors on which I'm relying in saying indemnity costs are appropriate in all the circumstances. Yeah. There, there are two other factors in particular on which I right. rely, actually, three. Um, the, the first is that the uh, application related to breaches of, or alleged breaches of, an injunction which this court held should never have been granted, uh, and which Michael uh, obtained first on a without notice basis, and, and then at the return date. And Michael uh, opposed the appeal against that wrongly granted order. The second matter on which I rely is that Michael issued this application in circumstances where the appeal against the relevant order was on foot. This court had granted permission uh, to appeal against it. And not only that, had listed a hearing to consider whether the appeal should be expedited. And Michael issued the application on the eve of that hearing. We say that timing is not coincidental, it, it speaks for itself, particularly when one looks at how long ago the vast majority of the alleged breaches occurred. So there was a, there was a gap of several months before the committal application was issued. In response, Mr. Anderson will say, well, there was the incident in July, and that was the one that caused Michael to, to bring the application, but he didn't limit the application to the July incident. He, he cast back into the midst of time and came up with every allegation he could. The fact that this court later discharged the injunction doesn't affect the, the duty of a person to comply with an order while it's in force. Uh, ab absolutely, it does not, my lord. Uh, 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 and orders must be complied with while they're in force, of course. Even if they're subject to appeal, even if the court of appeal has granted permission to appeal. Absolutely. What it goes to, my lord, in my submission, is the, is the propriety of the motive of the applicant, especially when an application is made with the timing that I've explained. So where an applicant knows that not only the appeal's on foot, but that this court's granted permission to appeal and is considering an expedition uh, to, to, to launch a committal application can be uh, abusive in certain circumstances and certainly at the very least calls into question whether the application is being made with, with the proper purpose of enforcement and not some improper collateral purpose. Well, we, we, we needn't go to this court, we'll be familiar with the, the recent authorities, in particular Deripaska, on the importance of special applicants fulfilling a, a true quasi-prosecutorial role and asking themselves whether it really is in the interest of justice to bring a critical application at a particular time. Right. I say, are you asking us to conclude 
that it was abusive? That seems quite an hour. I'm not asking this court to consider that it was abusive. I'm saying that it was inappropriate to bring the application when it was brought, so in, in the precise circumstances when it was brought. What I say the court can and should mark its disapproval of was uh, Michael's attempt to rely on the allegations in the committal application and the underlying evidence before this court on the last occasion as a basis for justifying the regranting of the injunctions that were under challenge. So, so Michael said the injunction should have been made, but if the court was against him on that, they should nevertheless be made afresh, in part because of the conduct, or the alleged conduct, uh, which he relied upon in the committal application. And he made an application to this court for permission to adduce the evidence in support of the committal application uh, for the purpose of the, of the first appeal. And that attempt was given short shrift by this court. This court uh, placed no weight at all on that evidence or, or those allegations, and obviously did not make the injunctions afresh. So my, in answer to my Lord, Lord Justice Nugis' question, no, I do not say this court should find that it was abusive because of the appeal. I say that it was inappropriate because of the timing of the appeal and where the appeal had reached to issue it uh, when Michael issued it. Uh, and that also it was inappropriate to seek to rely on the application and the underlying allegations in the way that he did. <coughs> what I do say it is abusive and abusive on the face of the application is the nature of a number of the uh, allegations. And I'm, I'm very mindful of... Are, the, are they the same ones that we saw in the petition of numbered 16 to 27 of some... Uh, well, al almost exactly, my yes. And so I don't need to turn up the, the committal application. No. There's an incident which is said to be serious, which, of course, I say isn't serious at all, seen in its proper context of, of Ivy ushering people out of the Riverside offices with a, a chair. But that's a part... The allegation, which, she, which she accepts she did. She, she accepts she did that, my lord, but that, that is not, and I should, should cross that lesson now, that is by no means an admission of contempt or an admission of breach of the order. Because uh, His Honour Judge Cook talked about it being intimidating while there was no injunction against intimidation. There was an injunction against harassment, but uh, His Honour Judge Cook did not consider whether the definition of harassment was in any way satisfied by Ivy pushing a chair through the offices towards some people. So it wasn't a confession and mitigation? It, no. was, it was no breach? My Lord, and this, is, this illustrates the danger of re relying too much, if at all, on a draft affidavit. It was an admission of the incident. So, so she said, yes, she lost it her... It was video, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, yes, it was video, but also she was admitting the incident because it happened. So she said, I, 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 I lost my call. Cool. I said some things I regret, and I pushed them towards the exit with a, a chair. And uh, n none of that implies or amounted to an admission of breach of the order, let alone a contemptuous breach. Uh, and the reasons for that are twofold. First, it doesn't imply an admission of harassment. In my submission, that comes nowhere near the definition of harassment as explained by, by this court in Thomason News Group. And nor, in my submission, does it come anywhere near the uh, definition of interfering with the business of Riverside, which was the other thing from which Ivy was injuncted. Th these are matters, of course, that would have come out uh, in evidence, been tested in evidence, and then been addressed in submission. To be argued at great length. To be argued at great length, well, ex exactly so. So, so, so what, was, what was not appropriate was for uh, His Honour Judge Cook to say, well, that was nearly admitted or arguably admitted or would have been proved. None of those things... Well, I think, I think it's likely that you would have succeeded on that count. Well, well he went as far as very likely. Yes. That, was not, that was not open to him. And, and, and I have more submissions on that, but I was guided the by my... The injunction is not an injunction against committing a tort of harassment. No. Uh, no. It's not an injunction against committing offences of... Well, I thought, I thought it did, did, did include... It's against, it's, 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 against, it's against against harassment... Not intimidation, my lord, and not against right. this. And content. Right. Yes. 
But when you referred to a decision of this court, is that a decision on protection from harassment? Yeah. My, my lord, so it's, it's Thomas and News Group. It's at the back of the, yeah. the, the authorities. Uh, and we, we can turn it up if, if you wish. But my, my point, it's, it's a simple point that the, the single act of saying some things that I do regrets and pushing them out of the, the office with the chair does, does not harassment make, or at least arguably does not harassment make. That's, that's my... It might be an assault when you say it wasn't a contemptuous breach, but, but in any event, the judge shouldn't even have gone there. She shouldn't have gone anywhere near there, my lord. That's, that's my primary submission, and that's a submission that I haven't elaborated, given the indication from my lord, Lord Justice Dean, but I, I have a, a number of other points on why the judge should not have gone near there. It, it, it runs contrary to the, to the golden thread of criminal justice, which is applicable to you. Quasar. There's a danger in inviting us to have a look at the nature of the allegations in order to conclude it's abusive without looking on the other side of the nature of the allegations to see whether we think there might have been something in it. I mean, that's the problem. Well, well my lord, I, I, can see, I can see why you might think that, but my point is not on the merits of the allegations, but the nature of the allegations. So just look at the, look at the allegations, assume in Michael's favour that, for example, gas bottles were filtered. I say that those are the sorts of allegations that should not be levelled by way of committal application, that there's a long line of authorities, the decision of Mr Justice Briggs in Sector Guard uh, being chief amongst them, that say that committal application should not be launched in respect of trivial breaches uh, and should not be used oppressively and should be used as a means of last resort, so a, a means of enforcing order of last resort. So, so it's, it's my fourth point, my lord, is one has to scrutinise the alleged breaches. And actually what one sees is throwing the kitchen sink at Ivy, trying to get her imprisoned for tactical and oppressive purposes in a manner that was disproportionate. And we, we got into the discussion over the July incident, because I acknowledge that's, that's Mr Anderson's best point. And I say it doesn't come to really anything, or certainly it wasn't something that the judge could have decided was likely to be proved. But, but my submissions on this fourth factor justifying indemnity cost isn't confined to that incident. It's about the totality of the allegations made against Ivy. And, and as, as my Lord will have seen, and I'd invite the court to look again at the uh, <coughs> allegations in the committal application, a large number of them are allegations actually against other people. And then there's an allegation that Ivy instructed or incited or encouraged it and no particulars at all are given of, of those uh, allegations. And before my lord criticised me for saying, well, I'm trying to have it both ways, the objection there is a fundamental objection that a committal application is abusive if it doesn't give proper particulars of uh, the alleged contempt. And so if a, an allegation is put that it should be inferred that someone incited or instructed or encouraged a particular act, particulars have to be given. You can't just make a broad assertion to that. And we have the in relevant injunctions in in the committal application, tab seventeen, page one two. My lord, well, not, yes. So, so they are uh, that they are recited in the body of the yes. application notice. So, so. At page 121. Can I, can I just ask, is there any authority on what the practice is if a commercial application is pursued to trial and failed? What the position on costs is? Well, the, the, the default position is that costs follow the event, but there's no default principle that in, indemnity costs should be ordered. That's, that's why my submission is confined to circumstances where an application is unilaterally withdrawn. And the, the, court would, the court would look at, for example, one could even imagine circumstances where a committal application having failed at trial, it might be appropriate for the court to make no order. And the best example I could think of, my lord, is where the respondent pulls out evidence from a hat on the day of trial that they could have produced far further. Or, or there are cases where no committal is made, but the court finds a technical breach, but 
one, not one that merits punishment. Uh, uh, quite so, my lord, although in, in that event it might be said that the applicant was still the winner. Yeah. But, but in my example, the applicant's failed because the application has failed entirely, the contempt hasn't been proved because of the rabbit out of the hat, but the court might still say no orders to cost or make some other orders to cost because of the conduct of the respondent. But but there's, here, there's, no, there's no settled practice. There's no settled practice. No you rely on. And, and, and my, my lord, what I do rely on, just so drawing the strands together, I hope the court has my submissions as to why I say uh, indemnity costs are appropriate. There's my, my first primary general proposition and then the additional factors I rely on in, in the specific circumstances of this case. But, but I, do, I should just mention two authorities, both of which are relied upon by um, my learned friend. The first is, is another decision of this court in Brooks, dealing uh, just with discontinuance under um, CPR 38.6. Um, and uh, that's, that's in tab five of the authorities bundle. Well, this is di discontinuance more general, of normal, not, of normal, not in contempt. Of, of normal yes, all right. Well. Um, and so just to show you, I, I, won't, I won't spend very mindful of the time, I won't spend long on this at all. It's just, it's just to make a point that uh, at tab uh, six, um, that's a paragraph six of tab five, um, is the summary of principles which was uh, distilled by his Honour Judge Waxman in that case, uh, in that first instance, and then approved by Lord Justice Moore Bick. Uh, and then principles are discussed that uh, apply to considering what order should be made. And my, my reason for showing this to the court is really um, five and six, so sub, sub paragraphs five and six. Um, the, the change of circumstances here had nothing to do with Ivy's conduct in any culpable sense. Ivy correctly appealed against an order that should not have been made. And the change of circumstances that caused Michael to discontinue had everything to do with his own conduct in getting an injunction that he ought not to have obtained and then deciding to launch the committal application um, on the eve of the appeal, which he wrongly opposed. So he's to blame, and I say that that's a, a factor which, which also um, takes this further out of the norm. And, and the I, think we, I think we probably have to bring down the guillotine, my Lord. Mr. McCourt, for it's unless there's something you haven't covered already. No, my, my Lord, it was just going to be a, re a restatement that, that's supported by authority that where the personal liberty of the respondent is at stake, that's a factor that weighs powerfully in favour of an order that might not otherwise be made. I understand that. Right, Mr. Anderson, you're doing this yourself, are you? You're not not my, my uh, Lord, handing it over to Mr. Stock. I'm slated for everything today. All right. Um, the, the presumption of innocence is a legal presumption in criminal proceedings. It's enshrined in Article 6 of the Convention. Uh, and it is that everyone charged with a criminal offence shall be presumed innocent until proved guilty according to law. To what extent does that uh, analogy with the criminal law entitle uh, Mrs. Loveridge to her costs of a discontinued committal application? Well, uh, by the time the committal costs came to be decided, she was no longer at risk of losing her liberty. It was a costs order. Secondly, uh, no one has asked her to pay any costs. She has failed to recover costs from the other party. Uh, thirdly, if anything, the analogy with crime would tend to suggest that she shouldn't have her costs, because if she had been charged by Michael in a private prosecution and he had withdrawn it, then the test under Section 19 of the Prosecution of Defences Act, uh, pro uh, I've written POA um, as the uh, Prosecution of Defences Act 1985. I'm so sorry, yes. I've got, forgotten. POA 1985. Yeah. Uh, unnecessary or improper act or omission has to be established before. Um, uh, 
costs can be awarded. But to give effect to the presumption of innocence, to go as far as the appellants would have this court go in this case, would be to say it's not that the merits shouldn't be looked into. It, it, the merits are important, say these appellants, but you've got to presume that the merits are on Mrs. Loveridge's side. Well, so if that's right, does CPR 44.2 not apply to committal proceedings? Do you, do you, is there a presumption that it applies, but on the assumption that the merits are all with the one party? 44.2 says that the general rule is that the unsuccessful party will pay the cost of the successful party. But the but general I, rule, but the court may make a different order. Yes, undoubtedly Mrs. Loveridge was the successful party. Yes. Yes. And what well, is the grounds for making a different order? Well, the, the judge specified them here. And he, he recognised that 44.2 was the rule. He, he said, actually, the first starting point is not the unsuccessful part, the successful party get their costs. The starting point is the court has a discretion as to costs. That's the if, first. If the court makes any and, the, and then the, the usual rule is, and then the court may make a different order. And that's exactly the approach that this judge took. And it's recorded in his judgment that he took it. And he, he then went on to, uh, to rule that he had the um, right and the duty to consider the merits uh, of the application. To say that he didn't have that right would be to place an unjustified restriction on the discretion, that not, not that 44.2 requires him to exercise, but that the Senior Courts Act requires him to exercise, because it's the Act that provides that costs are in the discretion of the court. So suppose that an application for committal for breach of a freezing order is made uh, and is withdrawn after the judgment is satisfied in full from another source. But must the court then uh, not inquire into whether there was any breach of the freezing order? An application for disclosure of documents is withdrawn. Um, th this is not in the committal field. Uh, an application for committal documents is, is made, then the documents are found in another place, and the application is withdrawn. Obviously, the court is going to look at the merits of the disclosure application. Why shouldn't it look at the merits of the committal application um, in the freezing order example? It should. And the judge did, and he was right. Otherwise, the appeal amounts to a submission that every case where there is an application for committal, the judge must award the costs if the applicant doesn't proceed to a successful finding. And there is no such rule. And that's why I venture to suggest there is no case where it's been held that a judge can't take into account the merits of an application to commit when deciding the costs of that application, uh, unless it's been proved. But anyway, my lords, uh, it was Ivy who put the truth of the allegations in issue in the first place. I if she had any confidence in the position she now adopts on appeal, she wouldn't presumably have put in the affidavit that she says she would have put in if the application had been persisted in. It, it was she who started the factual inquiry by serving uh, a witness statement from her solicitor exhibiting um, a near final draft of her uh, witness statement, the preparation of which is the subject of this costs application in the sum of roughly 20 odd thousand pounds. Uh, and she, she engaged in that witness statement with the evidence. She said, uh, and it was a witness, it was a, an affid a draft affidavit served as an exhibit to a witness statement solely for the purpose of determining this cost application. So the judge can hardly be criticized for having taken into account um, the merits that were addressed in that witness statement, that draft affidavit. If 
we look at page 8 of this of the core bun sorry the supplemental excuse me This is Mr. Rome, a solicitor's witness statement. Paragraph 7. The, she, she vehemently denies the allegations contained within the application, with the exception of one allegation in relation to an incident that took place at the first respondent's home site. Paragraph 8. The remaining allegations were completely unsupported by any evidence. Uh, this invites Judge Cook to assess the points that are being made to him. You can't make these points in a witness statement and, and then say that the judge is wrong for addressing them. Uh, the next heading on page 8, mitigating circumstances in relation to allegation 15, which um, answers Mrs. Justice Fox's inquiry about whether it was an admission or um, not. There are mitigating circumstances. So uh, Mrs. Loveridge put the evidence in issue. She tried to influence the cost decision by reference to the merits of the application, but now tells this court that the merits are irrelevant. Uh, so sorry, we tried to, tried to influence Judge Cooks. Yes, I'm uh, sorry. If I didn't say that, that's what I meant. I'm sorry. Right. Now, um, Judge Cook, having been invited to look at the merits, uh, was right to find that the application did have a high prospect of success. The words of the injunction you've already looked at, that they included not to make contact uh, with Mr. Loveridge or his wife, uh, and I suppose taken literally that would include not to make contact with them with a chair, and not to interfere with the business in circumstances where she admits driving out from the office of the business a professional value. Now, yes, at trial there may have been arguments about whether that was strictly um, conduct in the of the business of Riverside on the part of Mr. Loveridge of Michael. Uh, but if one asks, did she bring this on herself? The answer is yes, she did. Right. So turning to the grounds of appeal, we, we say it's simply wrong as a matter of law, unsupported by authority, uh, because it's wrong, that, that you can't take account of the merits. Uh, looking at the um, ground two, part of it partly falls away, because if, if you can take account of the merits, there's no persuasive um, argument that the judge got the merits wrong. Um, and Ground two appears to be aimed really at the, the basis of assessment of the case. Um, turning up the grounds of appeal. Yes, gr ground two is broken down into four parts. Firstly, it said this is not a case in which committal proceedings, this is page 15 were compromised as part of a wider settlement with costs to be decided by the court. The claimant simply unilaterally withdrew the committal application uh, rather than pursuing any allegations trial. Well, the reason for that has been explained and accepted in the judgment that it was because the injunction had gone. Uh, it, it is no basis for criticising Michael. I note that the criticism that's made of him is getting an injunction he shouldn't have had. Uh, that was an injunction granted to him by the High Court and he was seeking to uphold it uh, and the moment that the injunction was taken away by this court he ceased to uh, enforce it uh, he behaved perfectly properly there's nothing in subground one uh, two the fact that the Mrs. Loveridge would have sought to have had the application struck out is nothing to the point. Lord Justice Nugent's question is pertinent with respect here. If, if these 
appellants were trying to say that they, they intend to demonstrate to this court that it was an abuse of the process to bring the application at all, then they should um, seek to do that properly by evidence, but simply to suggest uh, that this court should take account of the fact that they would have applied to strike it out without actually making good that they could have struck it out for legal abuse doesn't get them anywhere. The same can be said of paragraph three. Uh, and in any event, the judge didn't say that every ground would have succeeded. In fact, he, he very properly balanced, uh, took a balanced approach, and he said that some of the allegations might not have been proven. So uh, sub-ground three is nothing to the point. And sub-ground four is only relevant uh, if we're wrong about everything else. But even then, it's not a ground which should give rise to indemnity costs. Um, the duties on somebody who brings a commitment application are onerous. Uh, they have to consider the public interest. And if they consider it's no longer proper to pursue the um, quasi-prosecution, then they should abandon it. And they should not be discouraged by this court from doing so by any notion that withdrawing committal proceedings is somehow in itself a bad thing to do. What do you say about the um, offer said to have been made, I'm not sure I've seen it, um, on the 14th of August? Well, um, it was an offer to accept it at costs. It, it, it wasn't accepted. So it, I suppose, would enjoy the status of an unaccepted offer if the claimant succeeds, if Mrs. Loveridge succeeds in her arguments. Um, but what that should be will depend on the exercise of this court's broad discretion, um, exercising it afresh if we get there, which I hope we don't. Uh, if we do, the, the fact that the offer is not before the court uh, makes it very difficult for this court to assess uh, what order should be made in response to it? The offer is before the court. I'm so sorry. Can we have it? Yes, it's a supplementary bundle tab to um, page 33. Page what? 33. should not make an order now that appears to discourage the discontinuance of committal proceedings in the appropriate circumstances. <coughs> there is some authority. Cole and Carpenter is in the authorities bundle. And, and it, it's authority, I think, for, for the proposition that um, where permission is refused to continue contempt proceedings, as happened in that case, costs do not necessarily follow the event. In that case, it's, it's a first instance decision. Yes. Mr. Justice Trow refused permission to continue the contempt proceedings, uh, but he uh, reserved his order as to costs. He, he made clear that the contem alleged contemnor would not have to pay any costs, uh, but reserved whether the contemnor would get their costs to the end of the trial. So it's implicit in that, that it, there is no rule that uh, somebody facing a contempt application who succeeds must have their costs. I don't think much else can be drawn from that case. Um, as to the analogy with discontinuance, uh, it, it's, it, 
this, the word discontinuance wasn't mentioned to Judge Cook, so it would be difficult to say that his exercise of discretion was wrong in circumstances where the analogy was not put to him. Uh, the case wasn't the case that's now cited wasn't cited to him, uh, and indeed there are if he'd been given the opportunity to consider it, there are um, very good reasons why uh, he he could and should have decided that discontinuance is a very different matter. Uh, not least the quasi-prosecutorial -prosecu nature of contempt proceedings, uh, which cast on the, uh, as a quasi-prosecutor, a special duty to consider the public interest uh, and to withdraw proceedings if the public interest is not being served. Uh, so uh, it, it would seem unfair to cast the quasi-prosecutorial duties on an applicant uh, whilst at the same time penalising them in costs if they uh, observe them and withdraw the application. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not really at the risk of taxing your patience, but just a few points on the law, depending on whether you want to hear from me on principles, so whether the order should be in, in my client's favour. Well, no need to repeat anything you said um, not so long ago, but is no, there no, of course anything I, I raised by Mr Anderson? No, it's, it's purely on, on the law, but first yes. one point of order, I suppose. Brooks is his case, and it's yes. his analogy to discontinuance. So yes. he cited Brooks, uh, or rather his junior did, in his skeleton, the paragraphs 34 and 35, where they suggest the analogy is apt. And, and I'm afraid I don't have the references, but I believe the analogy was also drawn before his Honour Judge Cook. But in any event, it's, it's the respondent who's urging that analogy on the court. It's the respondent who cited Brooks. It's hard for him now to say the analogy and Brooks are inapt. They obviously both are apt. Um, the, the starting point, uh, my lord's mind, was contrary to what uh, his Honour Judge Cook found, but as my lord, Lord Justice Nugent said, um, Ivy was the clear and obvious winner. So the only question that His Honour Judge Cook ought to have asked uh, as a matter of principle was were there reasons to displace the presumption that costs should follow the event? And uh, we, we needn't turn it up. No, no doubt uh, the court has well in mind um, in, in Capelli, which is at tab four of the authorities, um, cited with approval was Lord Justice Jackson's lament in Fox and Foundation Piling Limited. This Paragraph 13, there's been a growing and unwelcome tendency by first instance courts, and I dare say this court, to depart from the starting point that the costs follow the event. Um, that this was an example of a regrettable and unprincipled departure from that starting point. Um, I, I promised my Lord, Lord Justice Dean um, <laughs> the authority on the significance and the particular weight of the, of the security of the respondent being at stake. It is, it's Simon Phillips, which is at tab six. Um, and my, my lord, um, importantly, because it goes against uh, uh, and shows to be wrong, Mr. Anderson's submission, somehow we're in a different territory from ordinary civil costs. Um, it, this is worth turning up at, at tab six of the authority's point of view. This is the costs of an appeal where. Um, uh, to use a slightly inapt phrase, the, an appeal against sentence succeeds. It was an appeal against sentence that succeeded. Yes. Uh, and what, what was said by the respondent, uh, the, the respondents were represented by Mr. Steinbock, you see. And you'll see that the submission was made in paragraph three, that the contender had brought this all on himself, and all that all that they were doing was, was being officers of the court and helping the court. And so it would be unjust to um, visit them with the costs of unsuccessfully opposing an appeal against sentence. And the court uh, re rejected that submission and, and uh, as we'll see, it endorsed the statement by Lord Justice Sachs in Knight and Clifton. That's at the bottom of this page, my lords, my lady. And um, the points just to draw from that are, are, are that there's no difference in principle between proceedings for civil contempt and other inter parties proceedings as regards costs. And, and the special point that I wanted to, to, to draw to your attention was uh, that the court must keep in mind that the liberty of the subjects involved and give that factor 
special weight. I say that helps us twice over. Um, I mean, uh, it, it Sorry, goes. Where do you take that from? My ladies, at the top of five five five, we're still in Lord Justice Sachs oh. at Knight and Clifton. It's at the bottom of, of that cited passage, and then you'll see again that at paragraph nine, um, the uh, liberty of the subject was an, a, a factor that, that was ex explicitly relied on as justifying the order that was made, which was half of the cost of the appeal to be paid by yeah. the unsuccessful respondent. And, and that was a case where the contempts were admitted. And, and the, the respondents to the appeal said they were just trying to help the court. And, and just um, on, on the law, Colin Carpenter, as Mr. Anderson fairly admits, accepted, is not a case about a committal application, it's a case about an application for permission to bring a contempt application. And that there are a number of grounds for distinguishing it to the extent that it even assists uh, Mr. Anderson at all. But first and foremost is that, uh, as the court will know, in an application for permission to bring contempt, the threshold prerequisite is to establish a strong prima facie case. The court has to grapple with the merits. What happened in, in Colin Carpenter and the, the main judgments at, at tab two was that... No, Mr. Gore, we don't really want to go into the facts of a oh. different uh, case. Of course, my lord, I wasn't so about to go into the facts. I don't think it's going to help. Oh, my lord, I wasn't going to go into the facts. I was just saying it, it's distinguishable because the judge had to make a finding of, of merits, yes. made a finding of merits, so, so he, was, he was obliged to make a finding. Without that finding, he couldn't have granted permission to, to continue the contempt proceedings. Yeah. Um, having made that finding, the costs report is at tab one. He said the applicant had failed because the applicant had brought the application prematurely and disproportionately. So the applicant had to bear its own costs in any event, but left over for the trial judge the question of whether the applicant should pay the respondent's costs because there was a chance that the trial judge would find that she had lied in the ways alleged by um, the uh, applicant. And so uh, Cole was a case of not yet as opposed to never, as in not yet is contempt approved as opposed to never it will be, whereas this case was a case of never will the alleged contempt be approved because the applicant has withdrawn. So my lords, my lady, best I can assist you further. Prosecution of Offences Act, 1985. Yes. I, I do know from a, another life that, that that is the 1985 Act. Thank you all very much for your assistance. We'll reserve judgment on both appeals and uh, we'll hand them down in send out drafts in the usual way, not for re argument, but for correction of obvious errors. Thank you all for compressing your arguments so concisely into one day.